It's clear to me that attorneys and judges need to know more about science. They don't need to be scientists. They should be able to have a sense of that. That doesn't quite sound right, or that sounds like the kind of language that could really be confusing to a jury. Science is not the totality, but it's certainly a critical piece so that we can develop facts for jurors and judges to make their decisions. In February, the St. Paul City Council gave three quarters of a million dollars to improve the crime lab's infrastructure and to hire new staff. The BCA has done one of the most extensive And it's ever. only in blood recent blood years blood that we have started focusing on educating ourselves on these different sciences that are being presented beyond this just must be true. The forensic science shows that are on television create this expectation that we always have evidence in cases to test. Juries are so used to seeing in the modern media all sorts of scientific and technological innovation, sometimes called the CSI effect. It's just not in the cases, and the triers of fact expect it to be. Too many are confused because of the world of fiction. All the television programs and the novels and so on, which have the forensic scientists, the criminalists, and the forensic pathologists going out and following through on the findings that they have come up with in their laboratory. Hey, bomber. We got your number. That's not what we do. I mean, you know, you don't see the criminal defense attorneys uh, usually until you're in courtroom, and you, you don't deal with them. So our accident is not an accident at all. So it is understandable how these kinds of confused relationships evolve. Hi. <gasps> Sorry. Welcome to forensics. Well, forensic science is on the, the border uh, between science and the law. Uh, and forensic scientists try to solve problems that are related to the law through science. When we talk about the scientific method, as a general rule, we haven't been taught what the scientific method is, perhaps in high school, perhaps in college, but we're a ways away from that. That's not our focus. The many disciplines that make up the forensic sciences have the scientific method at their foundation. First, scientists observe the phenomenon at the crime scene, lab, or autopsy suite. Then, they use that data to come up with a hypothesis as to what happened. Next, they make predictions about what they will observe when testing the hypothesis. Then they test those predictions through experimentation. And the point is, no matter how many outcomes you get consistent with the validity of the hypothesis, you can always conceive of another test, another experiment. So this becomes sort of a feedback loop situation where a well-tested hypothesis eventually becomes known as a theory. And a well-tested theory can become known as a natural law. And then I think ultimately it's about uh, using the language of mathematics to describe our results. And virtually any question uh, related to a criminal matter or a civil matter uh, that can be answered by science requires an in-depth study of the underlying uh, basic science that supports the forensic scientist. The goals of science in general, th that answer almost becomes personal, right? Because I think you could get uh, several scientists in here and philosophers of science and probably get a pretty good arm wrestling match. For me personally, I, I think it's about advancing knowledge and understanding the world around us. The Trombley house fire? Mr. Trombley was allowed to dig through the debris the other day, and guess what he found? A metal button in the shape of a cat. I was supposed to guess that. Mr. Trombley recognized it, but it wasn't his. It seems the woman who lives next door, a Janice Baker, is known as the cat lady. And she's also known for a particular jacket she wears every single day of the year. So how did her button get into the house? That's a fine question. 
since Mr. Trombley never allows anyone inside to see his lifestyle. I was completely shocked when they brought me in for questioning. I don't know how that man got the button. I'd lost it a week before the fire. The trial is for that exact purpose. It's to define and define the quest for truth and define whether or not a particular suspect is guilty of the particular crime. It was bound to happen sooner or later. This is a decent neighborhood with hardworking people, and that place was a garbage house. I didn't burn the place down, but I'm glad it's gone, and that's the truth. The question for the legal system is the resolution of this dispute, and we've got to resolve it with some finality. There's two attorneys that are in the courtroom practicing as attorneys, and then, of course, you have the judge, who's also a lawyer. The prosecutor's role is to be a minister of justice. So they are not in the courtroom to win, per se, but rather to seek justice by offering evidence to the judge or the jury seeking to prove their theory that the defendant committed a certain crime. And the role of the defense attorney is very different. The role of the defense attorney is to protect the defendant's rights. The question for the scientific community is an ongoing search for an understanding of the external world. Whoever lit that place knew a little something about what they were doing. Hey, Jenny. Thanks for calling me back. I wanted to check in and see how you're doing on the Trombley house fire. We definitely detected gasoline in the hottest places of the fire. Oh, so the fire was intentionally set? Controls have to be run with every test. Uh, anytime you're doing a test, you need some sort of a control. And generally, you need a positive control and a negative control. Those are essential. And we use positive uh, controls to tell us our procedure is working effectively and we're getting the answer we expect. Negative controls eliminate the possibility that what we are seeing is a contaminant. Uh, and so when you put all of those together, your results are then trustworthy. My control is a sample that is not contaminated, as it were, with anything. And that's run to show that when I treat that the same way the rest of my tests are treated, and the result from that one blank control sample should show a baseline, a flat response. There's nothing there that's going to indicate contamination or something went wrong with the test. If the control fails, then the, the test or batch of tests uh, has to be repeated or if there's no sample left it, at that point, it's put out as um, control failed. We don't have a result. We can't give you a result. Well, it's a little early to say. We've just started comparing substrate samples. Substrate? Sorry, I'm kind of new to the whole forensics world. Well, it's a kind of control. In this case, we've got to compare our results on the sample of burn debris with some unburned background material in the same area. And that tells you? Well, if we find gasoline in places that uh, didn't burn, it's not as likely to have been used as an accelerant. It might have been spilled at some point and then tracked through the house or something. Sometimes we need what are called, well, it really is a comparison specimen. We used to call them substratum controls, but they're not really controls. So for instance, if you have a garment like the shirt and there's a blood stain on it, we would want to have an unstained portion of that. Uh, and that's a comparison specimen. The reason it's not a control is because its history is not fully known. We want to know whether the test comes up on that unstained area as well as on the stained area and if it doesn't, then that gives us confidence that it is in fact the stain that is giving the result and not the substratum, not the material upon which the stain has been deposited. Well, if it's got blood spatter, that's evidence. A receipt on the floor may be evidence. So it's by, by no means an easy decision to make. And that's where someone or, or a team of people at a, at a crime scene that are multidisciplinary would have to just simply decide this is most relevant and, and work from there. Should every cigarette butt 
that's uh, on a public street, uh, you know, 20 feet by 20 feet be collected. Well, maybe the shooter wasn't a smoker, so we don't need to collect all those cigarette butts. Did you find any tissue or blood on the broken glass? We did, but the heat from the fire degraded the DNA. Oh, so you can't use it. Weighing the value of evidence when there is very little physical evidence is very difficult. For instance, there's not enough DNA to be examined. There are times that we find evidence in very limited amounts. And those pose a special challenge because uh, crime lab analysts are supposed to provide uh, a part of the specimen for an independent evaluation by a defense expert. Unfortunately, there are times when the entire sample has to be uh, expended. Well, but we definitely have glass on that jacket. Oh, that's good news. Uh, well, the bad news is we've looked at density, refractive index, color, chemical composition, and all the parameters are consistent with the glass from that back door. Still waiting for the bad news. They're also consistent with windows from most of the houses in the neighborhood. Yeah, I remember. My basement window got broken into around the same time. Kids must have kicked it in or something. I swept up the mess and probably kicked some glass dust onto my jacket. Wouldn't surprise me. Arson can be extremely hard to prove, and actually finding someone to pin it on is exponentially worse. I think it's time to put this one to bed. I just hate to give up on it. You know she did it. Now, science has to be validated if it's going to be trustworthy. Uh, it's got to be demonstrated that it is reliable uh, before it can be used in casework. How valid are the results on a lab report? Labs regularly undergo validation studies, where they run tests and procedures multiple times to evaluate the consistency of their results. When you go from general admissibility of evidence into scientific evidence, you have additional requirements. In the area of scientific evidence, you have to be in an area that is beyond the common knowledge of the uh, 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 trier of fact, whether it's a judge or a jury. So let me be sure I've got this straight. A man and woman, both heavily under the influence, get into a car, the driver loses control, hits a pedestrian, and then the curb, flipping the vehicle, and then throwing both passengers out of the vehicle. Except the woman and the pedestrian die, and the man in the car survives. The positions of the seats and the steering wheel are right for a person of his height. And the crime lab says the only DNA on the steering wheel was his. But it says here it's touch DNA. Oh, well, that's unfortunate. I'm not even sure what that is. Touch DNA? Here, have some of mine. Really? That's the question, really? <laughs> the tiny amount that rubbed off of me onto you? Can the results even be interpreted accurately? It's pretty controversial. Techniques and procedures need to be validated at the front end when they are first introduced. And that's making sure that the, the piece of science that you're using will really detect the molecule in question or identify the DNA marker in question, that you've done the underlying science to, to make sure you've got the right reagents and the right instrumentation. I remember thinking I should grab the steering wheel, but I'm not sure if I ever did. Anyway, my lawyers tried to suppress the DNA evidence saying it wasn't reliable, but the state convinced the judge to let it in. I'll never forget how it felt when their forensic expert said, yes, in my opinion, the DNA from the steering wheel matches the profile of the defendant. Well, he made it sound like it was a fact, like my DNA for sure was on that wheel. But my lawyer said, the test couldn't positively prove that. So when you have a science that is unvalidated, we haven't done any studies to see what are the limits of the system, or we've done poorly constructed studies, or studies that looked at the wrong things, 
if we've got that unvalidated science, of course that can lead to a wrongful conviction because it's not really science. So it's being presented as something that's reliable and verifiable. But if it's not really science, then of course we can come to the wrong conclusion. Well, we only need about 25 skin cells for touch DNA. How is that even possible? We amplify the cells about a billion times to get enough copies for profiling. So is this one of those just because you saw it on CSI doesn't make it true things? It depends on whom you ask. Because of the accidental transfer, the samples are easily contaminated. And you get a lot of dropout because the samples are so small. So how does that affect the results? Well, it's not uncommon to get false positives with the DNA attributed to a person it didn't come from, or false negatives with a person excluded who shouldn't be. Obviously, some judges buy it. It helped clear the family of John Benet Ramsey, didn't it? Pointing to someone else being involved? That's true. <laughs> well, it hasn't been tested at any courts around here. We'll have to find out if this is the case we want to try it with. I think everybody not just the forensic scientists, the judges and the attorneys have to ask the right questions. It's not the right question to ask, how popular is this technique? How long has it been a popular technique in the forensic science community? The real questions are, what's its empirical merit? Someone's making a knowledge claim and they've got to come forward with sufficient warrant and justification to validate that claim. Long before we ever got to trial, my lawyers had some doubts about that lab. You have it then again, okay? Hi. Oh, hey. Uh, you go ahead. I'll catch up with you in a second. The vehicular homicide case. Uh -huh. I asked for the validation and accreditation procedures for the lab. Good idea. And I also took your advice and asked for their procedure manuals. Oh, anything come of it? I think so. From what I can tell by studying the bench notes, the analyst on this case isn't always following procedure. Nice work. Let's talk later. Right. Most lawyers and judges are not coming at the criminal justice system from a scientific background or perspective. The lawyers need to understand what the evidence is. The lawyer needs to understand what the conclusion means. And in order to do that, the forensic scientist needs to be able to communicate effectively both with the lawyers and then later with the judge or the jury. How reliable are the analytical sciences? Are the practitioners entirely objective? Evidence analysis relying solely on well-established principles from hard sciences such as chemistry, biology, and physics is often referred to as the most reliable portion of the forensic science spectrum. A number of other disciplines such as drug identification chemistry, forensic toxicology, and many types of trace evidence analysis all rest on equally reliable physical science. Physical science, however, is not without its limitations. By limitations, I mean, how can we identify uh, this fingerprint is coming from only that person when there really isn't a database to compare it to? There was one piece of evidence I was really worried about. They had found a hair that they said could be mine on the driver's side door frame. Man, I was never on that side of the car. And I don't get how my hair got there. It probably didn't get there. I doubt it's your hair. Your hair may have some characteristics in common with the one that they found, but we can't know how many people in the world have those same traits. We don't have a database like we do for DNA to compare the uniqueness of hair. In fact, the heavy amounts of pigment in Native American hair make characteristics even more difficult to see. So that means comparisons have even less value. So what do we do? Cross-examine their expert. Make sure the jury understands that the hair that they found could belong to any one among hundreds of millions of people. We've learned more and more about the influence of bias on people's judgment. What a pernicious influence it can be because it can operate at a subconscious level. And that is an important consideration. Human beings have a tendency to embrace facts that support their previously made conclusion. 
right, and reject or ignore facts that are inconsistent with their previously made conclusion. So bias can work its way into the court system with any of the players. If you have a scientist who uh, has been told this person confessed, they have information that has really no bearing scientifically on the test that they're doing, but does that impact their conclusion? There's a study that says sometimes yes. As a matter of fact, it does. When it came time to qualify the state's DNA expert, my lawyer felt she had to be sure that the jury understood one important thing. There was some question about his personal feelings and how they may be affecting his work. Is it true that you've made jokes about Native Americans being alcoholics? Yes, but I don't see what Is it true to... that your late stepfather was Cherokee? Yes. And is it true that your stepfather was physically abusive to your mother? Yes. I feel kind of sorry for him up there. I know the state wanted someone with more experience, maybe less bias to testify. But uh, he was one who ran the test, and I guess that was the law. It's true that uh, many areas of testing and analysis, interpretation particularly, uh, can be gray, can be ambiguous. Uh, that's difficult. We, of course, have to speak to that in court, and, and we try to do so carefully because the stakes are high. People, there, are, there are significant consequences uh, to our testimony. And so when it does come to court, we do try to stop at a point where we say, we just don't know. And that is often difficult to do. Clearly, the courts are there having a question that needs to be answered, and we're not always able to do that. And what helped the jury understand what really happened that night was a piece of evidence that almost didn't make it into trial. The lab director caught the mistake, though. Anthony. Yeah. This impression on the underside of the dashboard by the driver's door. Mm -hmm. I wonder if that striation could have been caused by a ribbed fabric of some kind. Oh, yeah, right there. Yeah. Wasn't the woman in that car wearing corduroy pants? Do you have the police report? Yeah. We're dealing with human beings, and any time you have an endeavor where human beings are involved, you can expect that there's going to be times that mistakes are going to be made. Perhaps because someone is rushed, perhaps because someone is uneducated, perhaps because, like everybody else on the planet, people make mistakes. That could happen to any lab analyst in any lab in the country. Human error and measurement error exists. Uh, so I think it's very important to give the jury some understanding of what the potential error rate is, and only then can they determine for themselves how much to rely on the testimony and the reports uh, of the uh, evidence analysis. And all the other evidence pointed to him. <laughs> it's like I was only focusing on the pieces of the puzzle that fit better together. Mm. Well, you know what's wrong with that line of thinking, right? Yeah. In a perfect justice system, nobody who's innocent would be in prison. Now, of course, we know we're not a perfect system, and sometimes mistakes are made. So then you go further and say, well, how do we fix that? This report makes a number of recommendations on how to improve forensic science in the United Progress States. Progress is certainly being made on the understanding that error can occur during analysis. It's how it's explained to the jury that is important. How can you be fair uh, so that you're expressing your findings and conclusions, but nevertheless indicating that I might not be 100% accurate? Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, jurors uh, have to weigh that evidence like any other evidence. Uh, so the more we think about error rate, the better off we are. Forensic science is very good, very strong, becoming more powerful every day. And yet, we don't have an answer in every case. It's so easy to get the CSI effect and to base um, 
your expectations of a forensics lab, the things they can and can't do, the very nature of their test on things we see on popular TV shows, which sometimes they do a really nice job of getting right, and sometimes they do a really nice job of casting what we hope things might be like in the future, but they don't really exist today. Law evolves slowly. Technology and science moves ahead quite rapidly. Law has to see that and figure out what's going on and frame it in a way that's understandable to them in this larger context. Science is always developing and improving and getting better with technology following thereafter. I think it's important that since forensic science is on the border of science and the law, that we have to be very careful what ends up in a courtroom. And even though somebody might call it state of the art, uh, it might not be ready for prime time. And we have to be aware of that. Funding for Forensics Beyond the CSI Effect has been provided by a grant from the National Institute of Justice, Office of Justice Programs, U.S. Department of Justice.